All right, what's up, Profound Travelers? It's your boy, Profound J. Coming from my home in Long Beach, California, giving you guys a rundown of the black experience or a black experience mine living in Costa Rica for four months. The dynamics and the stigmas attached to crime there, especially in black areas like Lamon and the history that follows it. And also, I want to talk about the rights of indigenous peoples there, how certain land uh, that was basically given or settled upon by Caribbean blacks over 100 years ago has now been given back to or in process to be given back to the indigenous people and how this can cause conflict because the country is dealing with an issue where they're trying to conserve as much of the not uh, of its landscape its beauty its appeal as possible especially due to climate change issues going on random droughts that are occurring also the issues of development along the Pacific coast where it's very high-end property so what's left is for parts of the Caribbean coast to be uh, conserved. And how is this an issue? Well, the issue is that directly, this is directly affecting the black population there because those are the individuals who own or have maintained the landscape uh, there in, in the Talamanca province along the Caribbean coast, along the Lamon area for the past hundred years. And as some of my friends break it down, the conflict is that a lot of the indigenous people may not have the skill set now that they once had to maintain the landscape like some of the uh some of the uh black caribbeans uh do have with far as dealing with the banana fields and dealing with uh, farming in general but this is not always the case right of course you guys have seen my videos of the bribri and how they live off the land how they maintain the land so part of it is there's fear there's paranoia there's a little bit of misinformation and then there's a lot of truth and there's a lot of uh direct marginalization going on as to why is this area being given back to the indigenous people and not necessarily the Pacific Coast and Juan Acosta and some of those areas where all the development is, where all the European and American dollars are flowing through, right? Now, when it comes to crime and perception, as I told you guys in previous videos, uh, two of my friends who are locals from Tiriaba, they have never been to Port Limon until we took them there. And they were afraid the whole time because the history of Limon's crime was a serious thing back in the day. And there's still crime there now. It's not as it's not as dangerous as it once was. But a lot of like drug traffickers live there. I mean, this area was a hub. It's a port, right? A lot of ships come in. So you have people from Mexico, you have people from Colombia, Panama, you name it, coming here, living here, or hiding in Lamon, right? Away from you know their governments or they're getting involved in different crimes and certain things happen, right? So this still can be at times a very dangerous place, especially since there's still a port there that is operable. Crime has been something that's real but also the stigmas of racism that goes back several generations into slavery and, and that still follows us now as a people as a as, as black people as a whole right which we all understand this right so when talking to locals i met a friend who chooses to be uh, anonymous but they come from a wealthy family who is caribbean black descended who lived uh, in turialba and they're from Lamont. and they explain to me now their family is a family of doctors lawyers engineers and so on this person is a lawyer and this person also lived in the united states before this person explained to me something that is kind of that's pretty observable for anyone who's been in multiple countries and as a person of color as a black person that racism is more normalized than it is systemic in some of these places. I remember watching a documentary on blacks in uh, Russia in the 1930s when their families came there and them explaining this, right? This is also the case in places in Latin America where it was explained to me that if you wanna go down to a court building and file a suit or, or, or learn your rights or you wanna enroll in the school or you want to get a bank loan or whatever the case may be, right? Typically, there are no system, no sophisticated systems in place to prevent you from getting something that someone white in that country or someone lighter skinned that country can get. The issue is normalization, where you're born black and you come from this history of racism, slavery, and oppression. You lack resources, you lack financial literacy and understanding, right? You come from these generations of the psyche being portrayed upon you as being subhuman and less than. And then you live in a tribal environment where all you are around can be influences that may not bring the best out of you, right? So people tend to normalize and accept their role in society. That's why it's considered to be normalization of racism. Like accepting being psychologically to some degree, accepting being a lesser citizen in your own nation. But when it comes to the system, 
there's actually no sophisticated systems in place. Now, you do have anomalies. You do have situations where people will directly violate you, the police, uh, court systems, whatever. The world is not perfect. We understand this. But typically, and by comparison to the U.S., the systemic approach is nowhere near as demonstrative uh, there as it is here in the U.S. So, if you're a black American, you may look at this situation and go, you know what? Well, that's interesting because we live in an area, we live in a part of the world where there's so much access in the U.S., but there's so many systems in place. The police, the justice system, uh, banking uh, frauds, misinformation, you name it, right? Things that have held us back and continue to hold us back as a people, right? And the perceptions of such, prejudice and so on, right? If those systemic issues that were laws against like, you have uh, the real estate laws, the, F, the, the FHA when it was first created, that, that red line uh, black people, you have the issues of uh, drugs, right? How people get more time for crack than they get, get for cocaine and cocaine is more pure. You have all these systemic things written into law to keep black people and people of color down. If those systemic issues were removed, a lot of us may feel like, you know what, hey, we could really thrive more as a people. Who cares if people feel passively racist towards us, right? Who gives a damn, right? Especially in the places that have access. Now, on the other hand, if you're someone from where they're from, the concentration of poverty is much higher. The normalization of racism is much more intense, is much more generational, right? More concentrated. Then you may look at Americans and go, well, you guys have systems in place, right? But you guys don't actually have this normalization of it. You guys live in the most abundant place on earth with all the resources and blah, blah, blah. Why aren't you doing more, right? With all of these resources, right? And see, there's a disconnect because they may look at us with some judgment, some of them, and we may look at them with similar judgment, right? Like, okay, you guys have systems in place and you guys accept the normalization of racism, right? And we both look at each other in a certain way where we cannot unify more as a people. Now, I don't want to generalize because this is not the case for all of us, right? But this is part of the disconnect that we tend to have sometimes, I believe, as blacks of the diaspora. Because we come from different countries and we come from different cultures, even though we are the same people, right? Have the same uh, heritage, the same ancestry, right? So part of what I try to do when I travel is to make more connections. Just learn, check my own ego and just learn and listen, experience things. And sometimes it can be bad, sometimes it can be good because everywhere you go, you have people in your own group and people from other groups who are trying to undermine you, who are trying to cheat you, who are trying to get over, right? But most people are very good, honest, decent, hardworking, kind, loving people. So don't lead with fear, right? Lead with understanding to make those connections, right? And those connections ultimately lead, lead to more liberation over time. Right, pressure makes a diamond, right? We look at hip hop for an example, right? What is hip hop? We understand it's part of our culture that we created here in America, right? But you also had the DJ Cool Hertz and all the other uh, African Mambada, all the other Jamaican Caribbean people who were the first to create the breaks, the loops in the songs, right? Break dancing and so on, right? Because all of us lived in one community, in one place, and that pressure of poverty and that pressure of also excitement and innovation was present. And together we created something that has helped transcend society in music, right? To some degree. So think about it, that analogy in another way, when you think about how we are as a people and how we get becoming more divisive, right, over time, and how we can use those disconnects and find ways to become whole and learn and understand each other more, right? And it's gonna take a leap of faith. It's gonna take getting out of your communities, getting out of your comfort zone, actually willing to go and learn and stop acting as if you know everything. Stop listening to all these fake, woke people online, all these fake gurus who think they know everything, right? Who are not experiencing life. My challenge to every one of you watching is to go out there, have your own experiences, right? Don't live vicariously through someone who is preying on your emotions, on your anger, who's trying to preach fear and, and scarcity mindsets to you, right? They, they're, they're preying on emotions of insecurities and fears that you may have. Don't listen to those individuals. Go out there, have your own experiences, and then you can make your, draw your own conclusions, right? And that's what I do. Traveling all around the world, traveling all around different areas of meeting black people of the diaspora, I've learned so much more from experience than being misguided by those. And I encourage you all to do the same thing. Next, I wanna talk about like police. So, one of my friends there in Turiawa, uh, he's like, uh, he's black, but he's more like a mixed, uh, darker skin uh, black. He's not like uh, like Caribbean black, but you can tell like it's in him, right? 
and he explained to me how the police have on normal occasions have shook him down for money harassed him or whatever the case may be but there's not that fear of the police actually killing you like it is in the u.s right and he talked to me in depth about george floyd and how it bothered him how it bothered so many people in costa rica from his family other people who look like him right and as we were discussing this i helped it made me think about like wow like we experience privilege ourselves while being there me and my cousin john my cousin john is i, I could pass as one of the locals obviously by the way i look right but my cousin john he's a dark-skinned black american and he looks like an american right and anyone in those countries in those countries latin america can tell of a tell you're american uh you know a thousand miles away no matter how you look right but he's a black american an obvious looking black american right we're going through cartago i'm driving a, uh, a car that's not a rental it's a locals car and there's a restriction day for, uh, for COVID on which days not to drive. I'm driving that car on the restriction day. I should have got a ticket. And I had something in the car. Uh, I'm not going to say what. And I was on my cell phone. So they have a checkpoint in Cartago. The police pull us over. And I asked him, I said, hey, why are you pulling me over? He was like, you're on your phone. I, I was like, oh, shit, I was. But everyone is on their phone there while they're driving. And I had just got in the car. And I, and I was trying to make a quick call. And so as I pull out of the parking lot, like the checkpoint is right there. That was all my fault. Yes, it was my fault. So as this is happening, I'm like, okay, I thought this was legal here, you know? And he like, nah, it's not. Like, like people just do it, right? So I'm like, all right, whatever. In front of us is a car of young people, six guys or so. And they look like they, look like they may be 17, 18 years old. And their car is getting searched thoroughly. And they look like kids. Like they're just ready to go party and have fun. They don't look like they're in any trouble or anything like that. But they pulled all the kids out of the car and, and searched the car. We are two Americans who had a violation because we're driving on a restriction day and I was on the phone. So I was breaking two laws. He asked for my passport. I showed him a picture of it on my phone and my cousin showed a picture of his passport and he looked at us and said, all right, man, like basically have a good day, like Pura Vida. And I was like, what the fuck, right? And I'm sitting here thinking to myself like, wow, there's some privilege being black abroad especially when you're an american and you're a tourist right and i don't want to spend too much time getting into like why sometimes those dynamics can work in your favor and also how they can work against you because i've also been a victim of police officers shaking me down for money uh when i had got a ticket in 2019 in costa rica right so it can work in both favors right but i recognize that there's a level of privilege that i had those six kids in front of me didn't have when really they were probably just going to go party and hang out and do something like that and I've observed these perceptions and behaviors in policing in Canada, in Thailand, in Colombia, in different areas and how they're so much different there when well, the police officers tend to be less volatile, less aggressive, more part of the community, even though there's corruption. And most of the corruption I've noticed stems from actually when you're by yourselves or you do something wrong and the police officers have the ability to shake you down for money, especially in poor countries. But if shaking me down for money is the worst that can happen opposed to getting physically harmed, I'm like, whatever. You know, it's, it's a step up in my opinion. No place is perfect, again, no place is perfect. I'm not saying this is gonna be the experience for everyone, but what I am saying is that there's a difference in societal perceptions and thought when you leave America and when you come back here, trust me. When you're around indigenous people, please wear a mask. I'm not like a super pro vaccination person, whatever the case may be, whatever, but I am vaccinated and I've actually gotten COVID while being vaccinated. I had it recently, like a couple weeks ago, right? And, and I'm not going to get into the science, all that stuff, and I'm not trying to have YouTube flag the video, whatever the case may be. What I can say is when you're around indigenous people, be mindful, be thoughtful, wear your mask, keep your distance. Uh, remember, these people live in remote areas. They don't have quite the access to modern or western uh, medicine and technology especially to fight against these diseases as a lot of us will because they live in very remote places and many of them choose holistic medicine and approach and to live off the land anyway right so be responsible don't go over there if you're sick don't go over there if you've been in a crazy party or whatever the case may be be thoughtful of these people right I don't care what your back, your thoughts are on, you know, COVID vaccinations. I don't give a fuck, honestly. Just be thoughtful of other people, especially these people who are the most vulnerable when you go visit, okay? Please be thoughtful. Just be thoughtful. That's all I'm saying. All right? And um, with that being said, look, man, I had a great time. I love my four months there. Uh, it was my third time going there. I really enjoyed it. 
and it was a priceless experience and again before we go i encourage all of you guys to have your own experiences don't be misguided all the answers to the universe are in one place they're in you they're not out there in youtube land even what i'm saying as one of my uh buddhist mentors which I, who I call him my mentor he always give me advice when i go to the barbershop as he always would tell me you want to hear more of my bullshit and that's all i'm telling you guys this is my bullshit all right have your own experiences because bullshit until you realize things for yourself right don't get souped up on ignorance and stupidity take time to learn take time to understand take time to make connections and grow so that's my community service for the day i'm profound jay it's been real profound travels until next video peace